All right, so I'm one of those uh, academics who's a basic biologist who Reason was talking about, although I am trying to move into more of the uh, industry aspect of it. Um, and I'm also a cancer biologist, so this will be focused on cancer biology, which is a little bit different of aging, but cancer is an age-related disease. Uh, so briefly, I'll just talk about um, some, the, the problem of this is, you know, you have normal cells, you get oncogenic alterations, you get an oncogene, tumor suppressors get mutated, you get this aberrant proliferation. And there's different steps where senescence can come into play. Uh, we could have oncogene-induced senescence, uh, which is one of the more interesting ones because it tends to get overcome, which is typically through additional alterations such as P16. Then you get these cancer cells that are growing. We know that therapy-induced uh, sen uh, therapy will cause senescence, so all your chemotherapies will induce different kinds of senescence. There's also pro-senescent therapies that are a little bit more safer. However, again, if the cancer can overcome senescence, uh, that's probably going to be a bad thing. So if we could clear those senescent cells through a senolytic agent, that could be useful for cancer. Uh, so I worked with, uh, been working with this company, Eternons, uh, which is based in the UK, and they rationally designed a, a senolytic peptide. So it's based upon, uh, it was briefly mentioned in John's talk, uh, the FOXO4 peptide from the De De Kaiser group, um, but they rationally designed a peptide that should be better. Um, so again, we all know that senolytics work on senescent cells. Um, so the way this works is when you get DNA damage, typically P53 is activated and undergoes apoptosis. But in some situations, P50 FOXO4 binds P53, preventing the apoptosis from occurring, resulting in senescence. Um, Eterone, which is, is the peptide that they've uh, rationally designed, binds in this pocket here, allows P53 to now undergo its normal apoptosis, thus clearing the cells. Uh, so, you know, we kind of need to prove it in cell culture. I'm a, I'm a mouse biologist. I do in vivo stuff. But cell culture, well, you need at least initially test the peptide. You've got to prove senescence. As was mentioned yesterday, I think there was one table where it was like a 400-fold difference um, in the amount of doxorubicin to induce senescence between one paper and another paper. So it can't be tricky. Uh, fibroblasts are probably the trickiest. Uh, cancer cells are a little bit nicer because they're... They just keep growing. You don't have to worry about replication senescence getting in the way. Um, so these are A375 cells, which are human melanoma. Um, so if you don't treat them, they keep dividing, and they fill up the entire uh, flask. Um, but if you give doxorubicin at the right dose, you can make up senescence. They stain with senescence-associated beta-gal. P21 is induced. I would show you P16, but they've already mutated P16, so that obviously can't go up. Uh, but we, we get senescence, and they're, they're no longer dividing. In my opinion, that's probably the best thing. So again, in cell culture, what we do is we seed the cells. We treat with doxorubicin two, two doses, which is what the uh, De Kaiser paper showed as well, which seems to be necessary in, in our opinion. Um, then we give our, the eterone and then use an MTS assay to measure uh, apoptosis. And in three different um, cell lines, uh, colon cancer cell line, ACT116, the melanoma cell line, A375, and a fibro, uh, fibrotic breast tissue, which is non-cancerous, in all cases, the red line or the black line is control, so dividing cells given different doses of eterone. And the red line is cells that were induced into senescence given eterone. And we see this a fairly good drop. I mean, is it, well, there goes that. Is it going to be, is it enough to show efficacy? I mean, that, that's always a question. But we get, we get a very good specific depletion of the senescent cells with eterone. So then we just also wanted to show that FOXO4, which is the target of the peptide, hopefully FOXO4, that when you give doxorubicin to induce senescence, FOXO4 goes up. You get nuclear um, localization of FOXO4. When you give eterone, you, uh, the doxorubicin induces the nuclear foci, but you see these uh, cells are undergoing apoptosis, um, and they're losing those FOXO4 uh, nuclei. So again, cell culture stuff is looking good. Um, so we decided to try it out in vivo. Our first one was a therapy-induced senescence. So you have a normal cell, right? As I said before, oncogenic mutations occur, you get a cancer cell. I think everybody is going to believe that. You give a chemotherapy, your hope is optimal levels, you're going to cause apoptosis, every cancer cell is gone, you're cured, you're in remission, it never comes back. However, a lot of, you're not going to necessarily be able to give optimal levels because you have to keep the person alive. It's kind of one of the parts of trying to cure cancer that's the problem, is you can't kill the host. Um, so you t there's suboptimal levels that can result in some of the cancer cells becoming senescent, and if they pick up additional uh, mutations, they could recur. There's also all the off-target effects, which I'm not going to get too much into, 
Um, but you're going to cause cells in the liver, cells in other tissues are now going to become senescent due to chemotherapy. That has because when you give chemotherapy systemically, which we typically do, um, and also you get these early aging phenotypes when um, cancer patients have undergone chemotherapy. So here is how I'm, we're doing the model. We have a human melanoma cancer cell line that expresses luciferase so that we can follow it in vivo. Um, in this case, since it's melanoma, we inject it into the ears of the mouse. Um, so it's intradermally, so it's an orthotopic injection, more of its native environment versus just a typical xenograft. These then get established um, and can grow if they're dividing. If we give, this, if we give them pre-made senescent cells, uh, then obviously they will not grow. And that's what I'll be talking about now. So we're going to give senescent cancer cells that will just stick in the ear, and they won't grow anywhere. And I'm still there. Um, if we do give dividing cells, they actually do spread to distant organs. And then ultimately what we'll do, in this case for the senescent cells, is we'll treat the ear with aterone, and we give the other ear a saline, um, just a control. So here, so we've done a bunch of experiments, but I want to do one experiment where I had, these are 10 different mice where they got uh, senescent A375 cells delivered to each ear. So this was measured just prior to injection. Um, you know, obviously some of our injections aren't perfect, so there was none in there. So on the left ear, the ear with the arrow received the aterone. Um, the right ear received a dose of saline. So and these are just local injections. We can't see, the, the tumor is not visible to see, so we just inject locally to the ear. Um, so I was hoping to be able to follow a time course. Oh, look at that, it's going to disappear within eight hours, 12 hours, whatever, at some time point. Um, so, so we did a four hour visualization. I mean, there was minimal change. We did eight hours. I mean, some, some of them maybe were going down. Uh, 24 hours, well, you know, I mean, well, this one disappeared. But for the most part, I was a little bit disappointed. So I told the technician, well, let's just inject one more time, and we'll come back tomorrow and see what happens. So when we did that, um, interestingly enough, every single ear that was injected with the second dose, uh, at least with the level of luciferase that we can see, there was no more signal. So it looks like we have, as well as I can measure, eliminated these uh, senescent cancer cells with just a local injection of the peptide. Um, so then, I, and as a control, um, the, if the peptide is supposed to work on senescent cells, it should not be working on the dividing cells. So when we do inject dividing cells in the same way, we don't see any difference between uh, the saline injection and ES2, which is our aterone peptide. Um, but again, when they're senescent, um, this is a massive drop off. And, and the only reason there is a bar here at all is because there is light coming from a mouse in general. I mean, if we subtract the background, it would be zero. So, I mean, so that's a mouse with no immune system, a contrived system that is, it's a good, I mean, it's some of the best things that we could do, but I, as a mouse biologist, prefer transgenic mice where we can model, and also I should say I work for the Center for Early Detection Research, so studying late cancer, they prefer us to study early cancer. So by using transgenic models, we can induce the mutations that occur early in cancer and then follow really an early melanoma in this case. Um, so we're sticking with melanoma mainly because it's the easiest thing for us to be able to inject into and study because it's on the surface. Um, so this is the tyrosinase CRE-ER mouse. So, and then we combine it with the uh, BRAF, which is normally wild type, but upon activation with CRE, you delete out the wild type version and you give the oncogenic BRAF version to the V600E. Um, and then P10, uh, P10 is then uh, has a locks P sites around a certain exon and. Uh, well, upon deletion of that, you lose P10 activity because it is a tumor suppressor. So you want to lose P10 activity, you want to gain the oncogene of BRAF. Um, so we can use 4-hydroxytamoxifen. Actually, the CRE is slippy, or uh, is, is able to go in the nucleus on its own, so you actually don't even have to give the 4-hydroxytamoxifen. Um, and then what happens is you can, you can develop nevi on the ears, um, and all actually throughout the skin, but they're easy to see on the ears. But if you notice these two bumps on the back of the mouse, um, those are actually early uh, melanomas that have formed that give us a nice target that we can inject into. Um, so what we have here is we have a normal melanocyte. BRAF gets activated, P10 gets lost, it becomes a melanoma. What we're going to do here in this case is if you give a BRAF inhibitor, the, these BRAF inhibitors do a very good job on their own of causing senescence and melanoma, and I'll show you that. Um, problem is if you remove the BRAF inhibitor or if you get additional mutations, uh, the melanoma will come back and start growing again. So I mean, it's a little bit hard to see, but this, so this is a section from one of those melanomas that we took where what we did was we either injected a uh, BRAF inhibitor alone or the BRAF inhibitor plus our eterone um, two days in a row and then sacrificed on the third day. 
Um, so with BRAF alone, there's a lot of senescence-associated beta-gal cells in here. Um, with the BRAF plus the ederone, we don't see any of the senescence-associated beta-gal, but the tissue also looked different. So we wanted to make sure, well, are we actually killing it? So BRAF alone, this is standing for tunnel, which is a measure of apoptosis. BRAF alone, there was no apoptosis notice, but with the uh, BRAF inhibitor um, plus the ederone, you get 95, greater than 95% apoptosis. So, I mean, it looked like the whole tumor was getting eliminated, but I wanted to do a longer term study just to see, is it really getting eliminated or is that, or the, a, a small amount of cells will be able to regrow from what we did. So in this case, we gave um, the BRAF inhibitor early, um, just before, and kind of gave them the weekend off, as some people would, like doctors tend to do, because then people they don't like to work on the weekend. Um, so you, sometimes you can give a dose of BRAF inhibitor, wait, and then you would start the ederone our, uh, the, the next week. And then we, but we also gave the BRAF inhibitor at this time alone. We gave BRAF inhibitor plus the ederone, and we gave nothing. Um, so what... So the, the tumor started at slightly different sizes, so this is somewhat deceiving, I'm not going to lie. Um, but the control got, it just got saline. Um, if you can see how thick it is, it, it just kept growing. The BRAF inhibitor, which we just gave the BRAF inhibitor alone, um, it continued, after giving the BRAF inhibitor, taking it off, it continued to grow, um, which are these lines here. Um, Ederone alone, which shouldn't be killing dividing cells, you know, it continued to grow. The interesting one, so if we give the BRAF inhibitor first, then the ederone three days later, it was able to then start to regrow after that. Um, but with the combination treatment where they get it concomitantly, you get the BRAF inhibitor and ederone at exactly the same time, uh, hopefully you can appreciate that there are just no, when I section through this, there are no cancer cells for me to even section through. It's just completely gone. The, the scab is still there from where the tumor was. So in terms of size, that's why the size doesn't go down. It remains flatlined, but that's because the scabs are, and I don't know how to measure the difference between a scab or no scab. Um, had, a, had I been able to let this mouse live longer, it had other tumors. Some of these are on that same mouse. Um, we th I think it would have, I'm pretty, I'm confident it would have gone away. Um, so, I mean, it seems as though we're, the senescent cells are this unique population that chemotherapies can induce different chemo, I mean, the doxorubicin induces senescence. Um, these debrafin and these other, which are safer, more BRAF targeted or other oncogene targeted uh, chemotherapies are very safe to use. Um, and then we can eliminate these senescent cells, which certainly could help for cancer. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a short story. We have a N of one or a two. Um, and then it could improve quality of life. It can get rid of senescent cells that are in other locations. Um, but I mean, it, it's, the, the data is actually very strong that, that this peptide in combination with chemotherapy inducing senescence can help eliminate cancer. Um, so one, one thing, as somebody had published, what, what, was, what was this paper? Um, we're gonna impair neuro, uh, neurogenesis oh, on a high fat diet and then it can impair neurogenesis and you get, you get senescence, lipid accumulation, anxiety. Um, it was interesting that, yeah, it's a high fat diet and if you clear the senescent cells, you get better. Um, so I happened to, for another experiment, I had a group of mice that were down, um, that were being fed a high-fat diet for six months. Um, so high-fat diets are actually nice for doing nanoparticle imaging if you use fluorescence. Um, so they had been on that for a while. Um, so, and, and then because they were on it for such a long time, they had gotten to be about 12 months old at the time of the experiment. So the mice were, I mean, they were pretty, they were pretty fat mice. They were 30, some were almost, it was about 40 grams. Um, which I would consider obese for a mouse. I guess for us, that's pretty tiny. Um, uh, so I gave, I gave four weekly doses, IV, of the ederone just to see what happened. And then the mice, they, they tolerated it perfectly fine. Um, and what we noticed was I, I didn't look. At the time, I didn't measure their weights beforehand because I didn't even know what I was doing. Um, but I said, well, we should probably start measuring their weights. So at week one, we measured their weights. And interestingly enough, the two that were treated with the highest doses of the ederone, the ES2, actually were losing more weight um, than the other ones. I mean, clearly I'm going to need to repeat this experiment um, many times over. Um, we actually have a bunch of mice that are quite fat down there currently. Um, but then, so we, we finally got around to, so we sacrificed those mice, and we finally got around to looking at the number of senescence-associated beta-gal foci in the liver. Um, and interestingly enough, the, the mouse that was given the highest dose of, of the peptide had, uh, I forget, it's, what is this, like a three to four-fold lower dose of senescence-associated beta-gal cells in the liver. So there's some, uh, I mean, preliminary data suggesting that we can eliminate senescent cells in the liver with a systemic dose um, of the ederone. Uh, 
which is, I mean, it's very interesting if that is true. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm probably, I don't know if I'm short on my time or what. Um, but so, our o so again, we are uh, academic researchers, so we have an OHSU team with, where Elise and Taryn help me with a lot of the uh, in vivo stuff, and Aisha Gould, Josh, and Michelle work on the cell culture base. And then we collaborate with the Edernon's team, which is located in the UK and in Turkey, where ML, Gunseli, and Ugar, um, they do a lot of the peptide design, um, rationally designing that. And then Yavuz is the founder of the company who's here, and you're, you're welcome to talk to him about this. Um, but yeah, so I mean, and again, we, so all of this work was done at the Cancer Early Detection Advanced Research Center, um, which is the, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so yeah, thank you. And, yeah. Thank you.